Hello, everybody. Welcome to another iSystem webinar. Uh, today, we will talk about a specific Autos ROS, Vector Microsar, and a dedicated topic, which is uh, OS and RTE profiling. So this will be very specific about task profiling, ISRs, and runnables for this Vector Microsoft OS without instrumentation. The speaker today is Felix Martin, again, our systems engineer from our US location. He is one of our experts for Vector Microsoft. My name is Errol Simsek, I'm the moderator. I will take your questions while Felix is speaking. You will be muted, so questions can be entered by the keyboard in the question tab. And uh, you can already download the handout uh, using the hands out pane. We will definitely, and again, record uh, this webinar and publish it on our iSystem webinar channel after the webinar. Um, the Q&A session after the presentation will uh, answer some of your questions. I will pick three, four questions out of your uh, list of questions. And the rest will be answered later on by email. Okay, um, that's it, I think. Felix, you can start. Okay, thank you very much, Errol. Hello, everybody from my side. So yeah, the goal today is specifically to understand how to record traces, OS and RTE traces for the Vector Microsoft operating systems system. There are some differences between the different operating system and this is why we decided to dedicate a separate session to each of those operating systems. And today we're going to talk specifically about non-instrumented OS profiling and we will see what that means. So I will have to be a little bit fast because this is a lot of content. So after the webinar, you will be able to set up running task running ISR profiling. You will be able to set up task state running ISR profiling, both without instrumentation. You will understand when you have to configure the hardware trace manually, and you can then use all that knowledge to record OS profiling data and optimize and understand the behavior of your application with regards to its timing. So again, this is specifically about Vector Microsoft operating system, and we assume some knowledge. So you should understand what operating system profiling is about, and you should be familiar with the concept of tracing. So if you are not familiar with those concepts, please watch the other webinars that are on our YouTube channel. And then finally, we will go through all the steps that are necessary to set up these use cases. So this is really like more like an in-depth tutorial. So there will be a lot of content and I will go through it quickly. But then the idea is for you to watch it again later on our YouTube channel and pause and follow the steps through so that you have like a visual guide to doing the configuration by yourself. All right. So. The agenda looks like that. I already mentioned the topics we are going to go through. Just at the beginning, a quick reminder, what we want to get is something like this. We want in the Vinadier profiler timeline, we want to get a dynamic view of the tasks, ISRs and runnables that are being executed by the application on the microcontroller over time. And then that allows us to, diff to do different kinds of analysis, event analysis, CPU load analysis, and finally finding bottlenecks in the application. So to get started with this use case, we um, we will usually explain or we will explain the initial setup that you that is mandatory in order to even do this OS profiling. Then we will discuss about the we will discuss the steps necessary to do the configuration and then we will see the results. And um, for all those three example use cases, we will first um, look at the slide and um, discuss the steps in theory and then go to win idea and do it uh, in practice so that you have a visual guide. So let's start with running task, running ISR profiling. I usually call that the hello world use case of OS profiling. So what do you need to do that? You need a Vector Microsoft application and a WinIdea workspace. Ideally, the Vector Microsoft application should already be running. You need a microcontroller with data trace capability. 
So that's the first, let's say, bottleneck. So your microcontroller has to have data trace. If you don't have data trace, then uh, running task ISR profiling without instrumentation will not work for you, unfortunately, and you will have to wait till next week or watch the other webinar about instrumented tracing. And then finally, you also need a so-called RT file that includes the information about the running task and the running ISRs so that the debugger can record those variables and reconstruct the task and ISR that are running at a certain amount of time. So um, the first step is to generate such a, such a RT file or ORTI file. And um, you do that in the DaVinci configurator by going to the basic editor, um, OS, OS debug, and then you can um, select RT. You want 2.3, and then you can select basic or additional so for um for the this is the setting i'm talking about for the, uh, this use case basic is fine additional adds some additional functionalities that you don't need for this uh, use case like for example um stack uh, usage monitoring so basic is fine but additional will work too then you add that orti file to win idea under debug operating system you open the analyzer and create a new analyzer configuration. Uh, for the Hello World use case, I recommend that you actually start with an automatic configuration. So in general, there are two ways to do this. Either you uh, do the hardware trace configuration yourself, meaning you tell the microcontroller explicitly what you want to record, or you let WinIdea do it, do it automatically for you. So you select automatic, and then you unselect code in the profiler tab. So we just want to do the OS profiling. You make sure that task and ISR profiling is selected under OS setup, and then you're already good to go and you can start a recording. Alternatively, you can also do the data trace configuration by yourself. So this would be the third step. So this is optional. So there are two reasons why you want to do the manual data trace configuration here. The first one is if you have a multi-core application and Vinadia might not be able to figure out how to set the data trace for each of the cores individually and you might get an error message saying not enough uh, data comparators and uh, in that case you then have to do it manually or um, that's the first reason that the, if you have a multi-core system it's very likely that you will have to do it manually. And the other reason is if you just want to understand how the underlying configuration works, you can also do it manually, of course. And then finally, you start a recording and you should see running tasks and running ISRs. And so that's what we're gonna do first. So I don't want to keep my annotations. So the first thing I want to show you in DaVinci Configurator is how to enable the RT file because that's important. So we open the basic editor and then we go to OS, 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 OS debug. So I did that rather quickly, but here you can see the tree. And then you can see I have RT debug support enabled. And there are a couple of other kinds you want 2.3 for multi core support if you have a single core system, 2.2 is fine. And then standard is fine. It standard is actually implemented in a way that doesn't generate any additional overhead in terms of runtime overhead by the operating system. Additional uh, creates a little bit of overhead. And again, they have the same functionality for our use case. So you want to select that and then uh, regenerate the um, operating system. So you just need to regenerate the OS. And you then, of course, recompile, and then you can add the RT file to WinIdea. So I'm not going to do those steps. I hope that you know how to do that. And so let's say we have generated the RT file, then we go to WinIdea. And as you can see here, my workspace is completely configured. I have a, a running application. There are some values changing here, so everything is fine. So you go to debug operating system and then we create a new configuration here we have a OSEC AUTOSA operating system in this case it's a microserver one just wait a little bit after each step to make sure that the 
video has time to propagate through. And then we get this menu here. And here we have an uh, ORTI file that's already selected as the file type. There are two other formats, iSystem XML, which we'll talk about later, and RTI XML, which is the successor of ORTI, which is currently being worked on and specified and will be supported hopefully soon so that you have to do less uh, configuration in the future. Right now, we're still going to use the ORTI file. And then I have my workspace prepared here. So in the Microsoft case, the ORTI file is called OS underscore trace dot ORT. You are, it's also possible with Microsoft to select, to create the ORTI file in a way that you have a separate ORTI file for each core. That usually happens if you select 2.2, like the older ORTI version. You don't want that. You want the OS trace.org because it includes the information about all the cores. Okay, so that's important. So I select that file. And then it's very important to at least do a load symbols or a download so that WinIdea becomes aware of the changes, namely that we added the ORTI file. And now the first thing to check if that worked okay is to go to View and then OSEC Autosa. Here you can see that it shows Microsoft. That's the file that I just added. And I can look at the objects statically, right? So it gives me the static perspective where I see the number of cores and the currently running task. In this case, it's not initialized yet because I, I have just um, reset. But you can look at the information statically. So that's a good test that the RT um, um, import worked fine. So then I move this out of the way and close it because what we want to do now is open the actual analyzer to record a trace. So this was static behavior, the OS objects, and now we're going to do the dynamic one. So I go to view. And then analyzer to open the analyzer perspective. In my case, I'm not going to select it because it's already open here. And then I get this view. It might look a little bit different for you, but what we have here is you can see up here there is a different views. So there's the raw trace output, there's the profiler timeline, which we have open, and there's the statistics. So those are the three views that you want. And if they are not there yet, then you know where you have to click. And then in the profiler timeline itself, there are another three icons show code for functions and runnables, show data. And actually, depending on how you record the runnables, they might either show up here or they may show up on the show data. Show data is for runnables and task ISRs. And then we also have auxiliary which is for network trace, for example. So if you have a CAN add-on module, you can record your operating system and the CAN network at the same time and the data, the timestamps are synchronized. So the time domains of those two recordings match. And so in this case, I just have the, I just want the operating system. So I have this view selected. So let's do the actual configuration. So we go to new and I, I have some configurations here that I will use later. And um, for now, let's create a new one, create new configuration. Always start uh, with a, a new configuration. You never want uh, to use the default one. Then the next step is to unselect uh, code coverage here. We don't need that uh, for now. The reason why you have to unselect this is because we don't want to record program flow. So make sure you unselect that. And then we're going to do the automatic configuration. Okay. So this is how the Hello World use case looks like, okay. And then here, in the, you get this new menu and here's the hardware level and the profiler level. So the hardware level is where you configure the microcontroller and tell it which data you want to record. And as I said, for simple use cases, WinIdea can do the configuration for you. So this is why manual trigger configuration is not selected here. So we leave that unselected and we go to profiler. And then we don't want code. Again, we don't want to record program flow trace here because it will decrease the amount of trace data that we can record. And we don't have network right now, so we unselect that too. But we want the OS objects and then OS setup. 
And now you can see all the, so I have a, we are running on a second generation tri-core today with six cores, as you can see. And if I tell WinIdea to do this configuration for me, it will yell back and say, that's not possible. And it's indeed not possible to record this running task and running, so you can see here the current task variable and the current ISR variable for each core because we actually have only three processor observation blocks. So I just start with one core here. So for core zero, I record the current task variable and also the current ISR vari variable. So that's the hello world use case that should al always work. If I select more here, for three cores, when ideas might still be able to do it. If you do more than three cores, it will definitely complain because it's just not feasible um, from the microcontroller side. So let's click OK here. And then we can actually go ahead and run the trace. First, it will go to waiting because the target has not yet started. And then uh, we're going to uh, run the target, and uh, you can see when ideas starts to record trace data and um, this is not a lot of data that is generated here so depending on the trace interface i don't know if you have see the, like i cannot actually see the number in full detail because i have a bar here but uh, right now you can already see we have recorded 20 seconds so i'm gonna stop the trace and then i show just show you two features that i like to use so the first one is make sure you select zoom all sometimes what happened what can happen is you're zoomed in here at the beginning and you don't see any data and you're like, what's going on? Is it not working? So do a zoom all to make sure that you actually see the data. And then if we open that, uh, you can see there are a lot of tasks shown here and not all the tasks uh, and ISRs are actually running. So we have a filter symbol here, hide areas with no activity. And then it shows us only the tasks and ISRs that are actually being executed. And then I just briefly explain the colors here. Blue means there's more stuff going on at a specific location. So WinIdea cannot render all the information that is going on there. So blue indicates zoom in to see what is actually happening. So to zoom in, I hold control and then use the mouse wheel. And then we zoom in here. And uh, the colors change, as you can see. And we have the dark red color if a task is allocated to a core and actively running the light red when the, a task is preempted by an ISR, the gray or white color when a task is not active, and then the green color here indicates that in case for the ISR, the invalid ISR here simply means there's no ISR that is um, currently running. So invalid just means like no ISR or default um, ISR. So that's just the naming that Vector uses here. And the green color indicates, yes, invalid ISR is active, but it's not actually allocated to the core compared to the red color. So I hope that makes sense. And let's look at another example here. I did a um, manual configuration for three cores. So I'm gonna, if I click the drop down and then click here, I can switch to that configuration and just do a new recording so that you can see how that would look like. And as you can see now, we have uh, data for uh, three cores. And what I did here, and I did this is very tri core specific, so I don't want to actually show it, but I did manually record running task and running ISR for the first three cores, and that's the data. Um, that we're seeing here. And now what I would do next, um, one of the things that I like to verify when I have um, recorded a trace is to make sure that my time base is correct, that my time stamping is working. So I do a left click, I, I hold control and do a left click and I get this blue cursor and I do a right click and I get this yellow cursor. And this is my one millisecond task here. That's what the name tells me. And then down here, it shows me where the different markers are um, placed. And I can see the delta from blue to yellow is one millisecond. So my one millisecond task is actually running every millisecond, which is what I expect. So I can be confident that the time base is fine. So now one last thing here. Why, what is this running task versus task state? What does that mean? So if we take a look here, and look at the 100 millisecond task. So it looks like 
the 100 millisecond has should be started here right at the blue cursor and then it's run again here at the yellow cursor and indeed there is a 100 millisecond gap here but if you we zoom in we can see there are actually gaps in between and those gaps are preemptions by other higher priority tasks so in this case you can see the 100 millisecond task gets preempted by the 1 millisecond task and by the 20 millisecond task now the problem is we know that those are probably preemptions and the task has not actually terminated here when the white gap start white gap starts but if we do a automatic calculation of statistics or validation of requirements then the tool is not able to interfere automatically oh this is actually not a termination but a preemption and that's the downfall of running task running isr profiling it gives you a good initial intuition about what's going on it can be used to calculate the cpu load but if you want to really understand like what's happening here like is it is, is the task preempted here or is it just is it just um or is it actually terminated then we need the ta so-called task state and recording the task state is what we're going to look into next so let me go back to my presentation and task state profiling for the vector micro operating system in a non-instrumented way is a rather challenging task actually so we will spend about i would say 20 minutes on this use case alone so how do we do it the first thing is we need still need a microsoft application so we already have that right still need an rt file luckily we have already generated that and now we need full data trace and we were i know we were already using data trace but now we really need a powerful data trace so there are different types of data trace available on the microcontroller so data trace is not the same as data trace necessarily unfortunately so what do i mean by full data trace by full data trace i mean the capability to really select arbitrary memory ranges to record and then also the trace interface has to be powerful enough to record the right accesses to those arbitrary memory ranges and the reason why we need that is if you look here on the right side so pay attention to this area now this is the so-called task state attribute so in the rt file there is a section where for each task each task has this state attribute and if the state attribute is resolved and the value is calculated then we can know the state and you can see the expression for the state is a little bit complex so there is a variable here and i think this is for the operating system application and it asks is the operating system application like is the os application currently running like that's the number two if so evaluate another expression if not then our task is in this state whatever that means and so on then we next check check is the task currently running so that's that part here like that um, equal uh, th that comparison and if the task is running then our state is zero which maps to running actually if we looked into the rt file and then if that's not the case then our task state is just that state here in that variable okay so there's this expression and now in order for us to reconstruct the task state we have to record each of the variables that are part of the expression otherwise there's no way for us to reconstruct the task state and to do that to record all those variables we need powerful data trace okay that's what that means and usually so in my case the tricore with the full mcds that's definitely powerful enough if you have a power pc with the nexus interface that's powerful enough if you have a rg850 with the nexus interface that's powerful enough if you just have um let's say software trace which is not data trace anyway but if you just have software trace for example available this will not work for you and um, please watch the webinar for instrumented profiling but if you have the strong trace capability we can go ahead so now the next step is vinidea is not capable of 
creating the configuration necessary to resolve the star state expression by itself. So we have an additional little tool called a system trace configuration helper, and that will help us generating the configuration. So we need Itchy, and luckily since um, I think the beginning of May or middle of May 2020, a system trace configuration helper comes directly with WinIdea. So we have uh, that tool available within WinIdea, at least within the recent releases. And then uh, once we have Itchy, we have to create a configuration for it. So that's what, what's shown here on the right side. And then I will talk about uh, the different uh, configuration steps that are necessary. So we have to specify the RT file, profiler XML, inspectors file. I will talk about what the inspectors file is used for. Task to core heuristic, we set that to true. That basically means that Itchy is able to figure out which task, uh, to which core a task is mapped automatically. And it does that, as you can see in the state expression, the core ID is actually part of that expression. So Itchy can extract that information and add the core ID to the task. That's important. Then we specify a default state and we specify constant variables. So since I'm already talking about it, what are constant variables? I told you it's not a trivial use case, unfortunately. So in this expression, you can see that the OS state is part of the um, expression. And usually this OS state variable gets initialized once at the beginning when the application starts up and then no longer changes because usually the OS state just stays in running and the OS application state doesn't change during, during the runtime of the system until it's later powered down, for example. So the problem is if we record a trace from a point after OS state was first initialized and set to running, this variable will no longer be written, we will no longer record it, and it will never be, we will never have the actual value of that variable. So to deal with that case, if we do not record from the beginning, what we can tell Itchy is we can say for all those OS state variables, and you can see this one is actually duplicated, so we don't need that row, but doesn't matter. And for all those state variables, let's just assume it's two by default. And then that will have the effect that Itchy is like, okay, two is always equal to two. We just get rid of that expression, okay? And this is for all the newer Microsoft applications, you will have to do that because the, um, the expression will always look like this. So you have to make sure to add this OS constant variables. And most likely you can just um, copy and paste, well, not copy and paste, but you can just add um, these values to your application depending on how many cores you have, okay? So that's what constant variables is about. Then once we have finished with that, it actually gets a little bit easier. For a second, we generate the profiler XML with the command task state complex expression. So that's this, this step. Dup. And then we add the profile XML to WinIdea. We already know how to do that. Same thing um, as with the RT file. And then it gets tricky again, unfortunately. Now we have to create the trace configuration so that all these task state variables here, all those state variables, each task has their own state variable. So we have to record them. We have to do that manually. WinIdea will not be able to figure out that out by itself. So we have to do it manually. So that's the first manual configuration step. And then second step, we have to make sure that those variables are displayed inside the profiler timeline as data areas. So that's the second step. And I will show you what that means. But basically for each of the task state variables, we have to add it to data areas so that it will, it will then show up in the profiler timeline. So then, so that then the task states can, re, can be reconstructed from those values, okay? And that's important because the way that the task state is calculated and shown in WinIdea is via so-called inspectors. And the inspectors reference those values here, okay? So we will do that. 
And once we're done with that, you only have to do all that configuration one time, then you can just regenerate the profile XML, then you don't have to update the configuration, but the first time there is some manual work to be done. And then finally, we will get a task state running ISR trace, meaning we really get the full statistics, the full information about all preemptions, resumes, wait states that are going on inside the application. So let's do that. Okay, so the first step um, I said is we need Etchy. So I open my Windows Explorer here and I switch into the WinIdea directory. And here in WinIdea, there's a directory called scripts. And then again, so you want a release that is later than mid of May. 2020 otherwise you will not have that directory yet and if you have a um, recent version then you can click on itchy and you can see there's a binary executable and there's also a readme so what i like to do is i like to just copy the executable to whatever location uh, that i'm currently working at so that i don't have to mess around with past variables or anything like that just uh, copy that here and then I go back to my uh, workspace. So here you can see I have a separate itchy uh, workspace and I just copy copy and paste that here. I already had it copied, so just overwriting it. Okay, so now I have itchy. Now, next step is the configuration. So if you don't have a configuration yet, uh, let's open a PowerShell window here. And let's try executing itchy. There we are. If you execute it without any parameters, it, like every good command line tool should do, it will give you a help eventually, maybe. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it's, uh, I, I could explain you the reason why it takes a little while, but basically it's a set of Python scripts that are packaged into an executable. So the Python scripts kind of extract themselves and um, that's why it, like, it sometimes takes a while to load. But if you run it without arguments, you get this help view. And then uh, the first thing you will notice, there is a write default config option. So if you don't have a configuration yet, I recommend start with write default config. And it's really not so much a default config, but more like a, it should be called write empty config. And it creates an empty um, configuration file. In this case, it's yelling at me because this JSON file already exists, so it doesn't want to overwrite it. Um, but that's the first command you want to run. And if you don't have a itchy.json in your workspace directory yet, it will be created. And um, so let's look at that file. It looks like that. So it has a couple of different fields for the different use cases that are supported. And I will just close that file now and instead open the one for our actual configuration. I, I won't discuss all the options that are um, available. I will just discuss the ones that we actually need here. And so those are the ones that we need. So the first thing is we need the ORTI file. Itchy needs the ORTI file in order to be able to create the inspectors and in order to see which tasks and ISRs are a part of the system. Then we have to specify output. The profiler XML is the file that we'll, we will read into WinIdea. Then task to core heuristics, I explained that. That just means WinIdea auto, uh, itchy automatically figures out the task to core mapping. Then we need an inspectors file just any JSON file here is file, so just call it inspectors.json. That file is actually referenced from inside the profiler XML file, so don't worry about that file too much. Just um, specify a name. I recommend having the profiler XML and the inspector JSON file and itchy in the same directory. That will resolve and avoid some pass issues. So I really recommend that you have a similar setup than I have. Just just place everything, place itchy, the configuration JSON file, and the inspector JSON file, and the profile XML. Just put it in the same directory, and then you can reference the ORTI file in a relative way, or you can also reference the ORTI file via uh, an, an absolute pass. So that should avoid uh, any potential issues. Then 
constant variables, so we don't need this value twice, so we can get rid of that row. And if you are using a single core um, microservice, your state variable might look like that. So that's for some versions. In my case, I think I don't actually need that. So in my case, I have six cores, and each of the cores um, has an OS application, and I set the state for that application to two to avoid that issue that I mentioned uh, previously. Finally, parent area template, just leave that as it is. Default state, you could set it to unknown or you could send it, set it to suspended, both is fine. And then WinRD tier D file is currently not required, so just, just leave it empty. Um, that's the, the fail safe here, okay? So I save that, that's, just leave it on the screen for another second, that's the, uh, configuration that we need and hopefully you should understand why the different parts are required now and then we can go come back here and let's see what uh, setting do we need task state complex expression our case prepares profiler xml and inspectors for task state tracing with complex expressions so complex expressions that's just the name that i came up with for like those uh formulas that have more than one variable in older versions of microsoft that state variable was actually a single variable a single field of an array so there was no need for this fancy inspectors and so on in newer versions of microsoft we have to do this so i do task state complex expression and then hopefully i didn't break anything Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> Let's not waste too much time on that. Um, let's just move on with the uh, profile XML. So if you, so again, what I actually wanted to do, I would run that command and it should run successfully. If you ever get any errors like that, um, there is a itchy log file created that you can um, provide to us so that we can fix it. I probably, while, while I was editing or copying and pasting that file, I broke something, I'm not sure. Let's just move on. The output from that command is the profiler XML file and the inspector's JSON file. And the profiler XML file, as I said, references the inspector's JSON file. And now what we wanna do next is we want to add that profiler XML to WinIdea, like we already did before. So I go to debug operating system and I uh, remove the existing RT file and then I create a new OSEC Autosar. We call it micro ZAR. And in this case now we don't use the RT file anymore. We use the iSystem XML. And then we select the um, profile XML that we have just created <laughs> hopefully so let's add that file and then let's do another load symbols all right so now let's do the configuration for that and that's the last step where we have to do some footwork to get everything up and running so I will show you what to do. I won't go through all the steps necessary. So I will open uh, my pre-prepared configuration here. And so I open that and well, maybe I, I will quickly show you. So what you wanna do now is this time we will do a, a manual configuration. And the reason for that again is because we have so many task state variables and because we want to support multiple cores potentially, WinIdea will not be able to do the configuration automatically. That's why we select manual here, okay? So in this step, you just select manual and then you will get a configuration that looks like that, where manual trigger recorder configuration is actually selected. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just showing it, this is for the tri-core, but a lot of our Microsoft customers are actually using a tri-core. So I will briefly show you what I'm doing here without going into too much, too much detail. So first thing is we have three processor observation blocks. And in this case, I'm recording zero, CPU zero, one, and two. I could select any three of the six cores that I'm interested in. 
And then for each of the cores, so let's look at uh, core zero here, for example. For each of the cores, I'm recording OS config trace OS core dynamic for the respective core. That's the struct that includes the running task and the running ISR variables. So I need those. And then also for each of the cores, if we look, if we look into that task state expression, then we will see that each task has its own struct. So it looks uh, like that. And so each task has its own struct or as config task underscore task name underscore dynamic. So that's what we're looking for. And if I sort by address now, then you will notice that luckily the tasks are in a consecutive memory region. So for example, if I look here, this is actually, if I pay attention to the address here, I can move up here. So you can see here, this struct is core one. So this is the last um, struct that is allocated in the memory for, for core one. And then this is the one for core zero. So now what I'm doing is I'm spanning. And if I click here, if I double click here, I can see that the state variable is part of that struct, okay? So what I now, what I'm now going to do is I want to record the task state variable for all those trucks. So what I'm doing is as a start address, I'm selecting this truck here, okay? And then as the end address, I open that view again and I go down till the last variable that is still part of the task um, um, structs for, for that particular core. So I go down to here. I can tell that um, this one is the last one because the next one doesn't have the dynamic anymore. And I double click that and I want to record all the data till state, okay? So now what we have done is we have created a memory region from the first ta task struct to the last one. And that means we will record all the right accesses to that memory region, which, which means we record all the right access to that state variable which is the data that we need. So I click cancel here in case I screwed something up, but that's what we are doing here. And then we're just saying, um, okay, for that memory region, please record the data, write accesses, um, record the value of the data that was written as well as the address. And if you're using another target, then um, like a power PC, there's a similar option to um, specify a data range and you can, um, follow the same steps, just the menu will look a little bit uh, different, but it's the same idea, okay? And I did the same thing for the other cores, okay? You can see here for core one and here for core two. So that's the first step, that's the manual trace configuration part. Again, I just wanna repeat that one more time. This struct here is actually, if I look into it, you might recognize, recognize this from, from the ORTI file, this struct, includes the current task and the current ISR variable. So I need that. I'm just telling it, just record that complete object. And then that memory region, we do that so that we can record all the task state variables for each of the tasks. One last note on this point, on the tricore, there's actually a feature called core EA fine. And what that allows you to do is, it allows you to specify a memory region and then select individual fields within that memory region. So in other words, right now we're recording all the write accesses to all the fields of the structs um, that are within this memory region. So that's a lot of data that we don't actually need. So with this fine grain comparator, as we call it, you are able to actually cherry pick only the task state variables. I'm not going to do that now. It's a little bit more uh, trace uh, configuration effort to do that and it's Tricor specific. I just want to mention it because if you're using a DAP interface, for example, and you're running into bandwidth problems, then that's a way to optimize that. In my case, I'm using the Aurora probe. And even if you're using the DAP active probe running at 100 megahertz, you will be able to 
um, record the data even if you um, record more data than than you need because you you specified this whole memory range. Okay, so that's a lot of trace uh, now how there given to you. Um, so I hope it's not too much information. If you're unsure about how to do this configuration, um, please look into the application notes and uh, the documentation for the specific CPU architectures where we explain how to configure this in detail. Okay, so. Again, I click cancel here too, just in case I screwed something up. And then that's the first step. So now we are, have made sure that the TriCore will record all the data that we're interested in. And now the next step is to tell Vinadia to analyze the data in the way that we wanted to, um, to, to analyze it. So the first thing is now under OS setup, I still have um, the task in ISRs. I've just selected everything here. It doesn't really matter because now, since we have manual um, configuration, Avinadia will not configure anything. So in other words, if, if, if for example, this core four data is not there, then it will, so let me say that again. If the data for core four, for example, is not part of the hardware trace configuration that we did, then Vinadia will not show anything and will not cause any negative effects. If the data is there, for example, for core zero, where we just did the manual configuration, then it will show to us, okay? So that's why my point simply is just select everything here and that's fine, okay? That's step one, that was the easy part. Now the hard part is, as I mentioned, we are having this feature called inspectors. And the inspectors will reconstruct the task state for us. In order for the inspectors to reconstruct the task states, we need to add a data area for each of the task state variables. And that's what I did here. So you can see for all uh, the, <laughs> the, and I'm just laughing because it's a little bit of manual configuration effort. I had it automized once and I hopefully will automize it again um, as part of itch in the future. But right now for all, what you have to do is you, again, you create a new data area here and then you look for your um, OS config task variables and then you just go through the list. You just go through the list for each of them. You select it. At the end, you add dot state. You have to make sure that there are no braces here. That's important because there are no braces in the RT file, so there are no braces in the inspectors. So this wouldn't work. It has to look like this. That you go through the, through the list and you add it. So that's a good task for an intern if you have one. And then once you have done that once, you don't have to do it again. Okay. So do that. And then make sure that you also select data area here. So what that means at the end of the day is we have configured the tri-core to record the right accesses to the state variables. And now we are telling the profiler, if there's a right access to that state area, please visualize it to us and show it in the timeline, okay? So that was a lot of work, but now we are actually ready to go ahead and uh, record a trace. So gonna start the trace first and then the target and then we are recording and as you can see it looks a little bit weird <clears throat> and as i told you when it looks weird just press um, the auto zoom button here and then oh you can see there's actual data so it was just zoomed in too far <clears throat> and let me stop the recording here just to not um, you can see that the inspectors are still processing uh, down here. So let's just let that finish quickly so that, that we don't run into any issues. All right. So, and now why did we do all of this? So if we zoom in again and like look at our 100 millisecond task, for example, you will notice there's still the gaps here, but now if we open and uh, now we have a, a, a checkbox here or like a, this plus sign to expand that task. I want you to, to um, ignore SAR. We don't uh, need that for our use case. But what you can see in addition to that is that there are now this inspector symbols. 
And those inspector symbols are actually showing us what the task is doing. Like it, it gives us the information that we wanted. So we can see at some point, this is an extended task. So it has a waiting set. The task was just waiting to be activated by the operating system. And then at some point it gets um, into the ready state. And then this is the, the time when the task is ready to be scheduled by the operating system. As we can see down here, the 20 millisecond task is still running. So that's why it's taking a while till it's actually executed by the operating system. So that's called what's called the initial pending time, the time from the activation. And in this case, it's not an activation, it's a set event. The time from the set event to the time uh, the task is then actually scheduled by the operating system. And then the task goes uh, to running and uh, is uh, preempted by ISR. So it goes to the ready ISR states and then it's preempted by a task one millisecond and you really you got the get the idea and then eventually it goes back into the waiting state and this is the information as i said in the beginning that we need to get the full picture of what's going on and now um, for that uh, we could actually for example take a look at, look at the statistics so um, up here profiler statistics actually we have this auto expand button here so you can see the statistics for my code area are empty but now if i um, expand the task uh, i will actually get accurate statistics in in terms of the um, different execution times so i can click here um, maybe i should also select the filter button so that the areas that have no activity are not shown and then there are a couple of statistics that i can select here um, so for example um, a common use case is uh, calculating the CPU load. So in my case here, I have an uh, idle task that is called default background task. So to get the CPU load, what I can do is I can say, okay, for 14, for 4.7 seconds out of the 19.4 seconds that my trace was recording, the idle task was active. That's equal to 24%. And um, so then I know 100 minus the 24, that's my actual, actual CPU load. So in other, other words, like my system was active for 76% of the time and uh, the other 24%, the idle, idle task was active. And now I could also look in and it also shows me the statistics, how long was the task in ready, running and so on. Another cool thing that I can do, and now I actually can't, press the auto zoom button because I can't, can't see it. So I have to manually pull it down. Another cool thing that you can do with this data is you can um, export a so-called BTF trace. So if you're using the vector timing architects tool suite, for example, you can click here, select export BTF and the BTF trace is already automatically configured by itchy. So that's the nice thing. So you can export here and then you will get a so-called scheduling trace and what it is it's essentially a list of the different events that happened inside the application so task starts task stops and so on and you can use that for further evaluation if you want to analyze the statistics by yourself then i recommend export and um, use the xml format that's the easiest uh, one uh, to parse and to gener generate reports from automatically all right so that was a lot of content, um, but I'm happy that we finally have it on, on record so that you can go through the steps and do the configuration by yourself. So now we will have only five minutes left. Um, so I will go through the last um, use case really quickly, just to mention it for completeness sake. So the last use case is runnable profiling. In order to do runnable profiling without instrumentation, you need program flow trace capabilities. Once you have program flow trace capabilities, you add another section to the itchy configurator file, that uh, itchy configuration file that lists the runnables. And then you, I, I recommend just using the configuration from the previous step, just extend that configuration with the runnables. And then when you execute itchy, you want the task state complex expression as well as the runnable program flow flag. So Let's see how that looks like in the configuration file. Just open it here. And the difference to the previous configuration is this section here. 
Okay. So we just add a um, object runnable program flow, and then we just list the runnables. And in this case, I'm listing the, the run, some runnables that I have here on core one. Um, maybe two things I want to mention here is if you specify file passes in JSON, uh, make, make sure that you use this uh, backslash. Um, if you uh, use a front slash here, that, that's an escape character, and that would be invalid JSON in that case. And also make sure at the end of lists, you don't want a trailing comma. Um, you don't want a trailing comma uh, here either. So though if the um, parser, the, the JSON parser yells at you, um, look for those two things first. It's usually either a, a semicolon that shouldn't be there, or not a semicolon, a comma that shouldn't be there, or um, a invalid um, slash. So you want those backslashes. OK, so you do that. Then now we would go, to go ahead and um, run that and add the um, runnable program flow option. I won't execute it because I assume that that error, whatever it is, is still there. But um, you would execute this command and your profile XML will update. And then in my case, the profile XML already has the runnables in it. So Again, make sure that you have the right profile XML selected. And then if you go to the configuration, you will have, another, if you scroll down, you will have another object here. It's called all course runnables via program flow. And as you can see, it contains the runnables that I have specified, specified in my itchy configuration file. So make sure that this is selected. So that's the first step. And now the second step is, and I'm going to switch configurations for that. Uh, let's see, task states runnables. So the first step is to make sure that runnables is selected. In this case, it actually wasn't. So I select that again. That's the first step. And then the second step is that you select program flow for the particular core that you want to record. Usually you will ever be able to record the program flow trace for one core. Like if you do it for multiple cores, it will be too much data. And you can see here in my case, process observation, observation block um, X maps to CPU one, and I have a PTU enable selected here. Okay, so you have to do those steps. Again, for other architectures, it might look differently. And then uh, I can go ahead and start the trace recording. And as you can see, a win idea, and I stopped that so that we don't uh, waste time. The win idea has a harder time processing the data now because now we have um, data trace and program flow trace, which is um, far more expensive to process. So it's still analyzing here. Now it's done. And now what I have to do is I actually have to remove the hide areas with no activity filter. So I'm going to remove that, and then I'm just going to close all of that. And if I scroll through the list, you will see somewhere there should be the runnables down here. Win idea um, is actually uh, showing me the runnables that are uh, running inside the application now. Okay, so that's the data that I was interested in. Again, the blue color means there's more going on there. Um, there might be a white gap. So for example, like this, between this one millisecond runnables, there should actually be little gaps there. And then um, the, uh, the light red color in this case doesn't mean that the runnable is preempted. It can mean that the runnable is preempted or it can mean that the runnable is calling a sub runnable or sub function. So that's important to understand there. So the diff, the metrics for runnables and the metrics for tasks have to in, be interpreted slightly different, okay? Um, that's important to understand for the runnables, but you get the idea. We see the runnables that are, that are running here and the runnables will now also be exported to the BTF trace if you're using that feature. And with that, I'm going back to the presentation and uh, just going to do a little conclusion. We discussed three major use cases today. So I recommend always start with the hello world. Just do for one core, do the running task and the running ISR. Once that works, go from there. Depending on your configuration, you might consider other use cases or other approaches. And 
this is what we're going to talk about in the next webinar. So if you don't have powerful data trace or if you don't have program flow trace, then you might need instrumentation. That means we add a little bit of code to the application and and that that code will then allow us to record the data we will have a really tiny amount of overhead but it but we we, we sacrifice that overhead so uh, that we get the full insight into the timing behavior of our application and i think that's everything I wanted to say on this conclusion slide so yeah thank you very much for uh, uh, your attention uh, I hope it's okay that it took a little bit longer. As you can see, it's non-trivial to configure just because this task state complex, um, uh, this task state expression is a little bit complex. So we had to um, uh, make some effort to support it. But now we actually have a couple of customers who use this uh, feature. So um, I hope that, that that you're the next one utilizing it. So I say thank you very much for your um, attention again, and uh, I give it back to Errol. Thank you, Felix, um, for your interesting presentation. Very complex stuff. Um, there was one question at the very beginning, and I think it's uh, really worth to, to, to talk about that, about overflows, or so to avoid that uh, tracing stops. Uh, I think uh, real systems have uh, much more tasks and maybe also an increasing number of tasks. And uh, you also mentioned the TRICO with the three bus observation blocks. Uh, and uh, so that you cannot trace everything, right? And um, how? Uh, what is the strategy to avoid overflows? Is this more hardware related? Is it configuration related? Yeah. So there. So there. The, yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. So there's different. There are different um, approaches you can take. So the first one, if you, whenever you get overflows when doing trace recordings, you the first thought should be, can I limit the amount of data that is recorded and still get the information that I need. So for example, on the tricore, well, um, we have this fine grain comparators that you uh, could use to only really select those variables that you're interested in. If you're, if you're trying to limit the data down and you can't, you're still getting overflows, then it might just not be feasible from the microcontroller side to, um, to transmit that much data. But what you can try is you can see if there's another trace interface available for your microcontroller. So for example, if you're using the tricore and you're having a DAP passive probe and you can run that at, all, let's say, up to 30 megahertz maybe, maybe it's possible to switch to an active probe and run it as 150 megahertz, which will um, then allow the debugger to get more data off the chip and uh, then you can record longer traces. So again, the first step is um, filter the data that you actually need, in the, and that's microcontroller specific. The second step is um, see if you can use a faster, a better trace interface, so for, or utilize the interface that you have in a better way. Um, for example, switch from passive probe to active probe. And then the third step is if you have like the strongest trace interface and you limit it down the data and it's still you're still getting overflows, then you might have to look into another solution. Then maybe you have um, to use a little bit of instrumentation just so that you can make the instrumentation um, record the data in a more efficient way with less write accesses to the variables, and then you can record um, via that instrumentation. So that would be uh, the third step that I would use. So that's that, that part of the question. Um, I, I didn't see the question, so Errol, so maybe I, just one point that I wanted to add. If your question was how to detect task overflows, and maybe that's completely different, but um, and not the question that was asked, what can happen in an auto cell operating system is that you have, a, let's say, a 20 millisecond task um, like I have here in my um, example application. Let me filter that areas again. And you, you can have a 20 millisecond task, but then it's not actually executed every 20 milliseconds because there's too much load in the system. And that what we call it a task activation overflow. So that's just why it, uh, it, it, it triggered, um, 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 uh, that's why I was thinking of that. So if that's happening in your application, how can you detect that? And um, I think the easiest way to detect it is actually going 
here um, to the to the statistics and let me look at the one millisecond task and click um, properties to look at the statistics and look at the maximum and the minimum period of your task so if your task is activated every time it should be activated then your period should be the max and the min period should be around the average period if a task overflows and is not activated often enough um, then the max period will be higher than the one millisecond so for example it might be two milliseconds because it's like one um, activation was skipped so that's um, a way to recognize that you have uh, multiple activation also called it's also called multiple activations in your system so i don't know if that was the question but i just wanted to mention it for completeness sake okay Aero, <laughs> that was a long answer again yeah great 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 very good thank you very much felix i think that's it also for today next week we have this instrumentation version of the webinar maybe this uh, is also a good uh, add-on to this webinar and uh, you find more information on our website uh, in, on the event calendar uh, about next webinars you can send us an email if you have more questions or if you want to have a direct contact felix and um in the handouts pdf file there you find these links for tutorials application notes uh, webinars and also registrations possibilities for our newsletter where you get informed about new webinars so thank you very much felix and you guys who attended a lot of people attended so this is a very uh, hot topic and a complex top topic hope uh, we could help you a little bit recording will be online uh, tomorrow afternoon so you can go through it again so thank you very much and see you soon again bye bye thank you bye bye